Welcome back, everybody. It's time once again for another episode of Health Talks with Dr. Trin. The one show, the only show that shows you the path to a healthier life. One conversation at a time. Welcome back, or should I say one neuron at a time. We're going to talk about memory today here. Is that right, Dr. Trin? We are. You sound a little muffled, Paul. Do I? Okay. You sound a little muffled, Craig? Yeah, he sounds like he's clipping. Clipping, all right. Well, we'll see if that's any better there. How's that? A little better. Uh, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'll let you do most of the talking. Well, go ahead. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Welcome. I'm excited to bring on a good friend, Professor Craig Stark at uh, UC Irvine here, Department of Neurobiology. Is that right, Craig? Yep. Neurobiology and Behavior. Excellent. Excellent. And so we met actually over dinner. I think it was right before the pandemic closed everything. Was it uh, Sigistrum? At the New Year Festival. New Year Festival. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And so, Paul, this is something interesting. I grew up as a uh, gamer. Did you? I didn't know that. I think I actually talked about it a little bit, yeah. I grew up with originally, I think it was Doom and Duke Nukem. And mm -hmm. Remember all that, Craig? Oh, yeah. Is that 1990s? I'm trying to remember. And then I advanced on to other games, World uh, Warcraft, and then I wow. upgraded myself to Starcraft, mm -hmm. and then World of Warcraft, and then the later games would be League of Legends and Minecraft and all that. And as a matter of fact, when I was in high school and junior high, I would save up my lunch money and skip lunch because okay. I would have, lunch was a dollar back then. Mm -hmm. Back, especially junior high time, I would skip lunch because I had four quarters. That allowed me four games at the local arcade walking home. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And then when I met Craig, he was telling me that playing games could actually be beneficial for your brain and your memory and, and all that. And I was just kind of blown away because I've always told my son, you're playing too many games. Yeah, right. What did your parents think or your mom think of you playing video games? Probably not much. Well, I played the arcade games walking home, so they didn't quite know that I didn't eat lunch. So now I will note here, of course, that you're <laughs> chastising your kid for doing exactly what you were doing as a kid. So uh, yeah, yeah. Just, just making sure that wasn't lost on the listener here. It wasn't lost. <laughs> yes, yes. The, the hypocrisy of it all. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And so this is amazing what Professor Craig is doing here at UC Irvine, and I wanted to bring him on to share about his projects. All right, so tell us what your projects are, what's your specialty, and what are you doing at UCI? So I've been studying how memory works for the last several decades and how different brain structures are involved in memory, what they do, and then it started turning into how do they change with age and how can we tell aging from something like dementia, something like Alzheimer's disease? And you do research like this long enough, and you're giving talks on it over and over again, and your hair starts getting a little white in it and this kind of thing. Oh, sorry, my beard because I'm bald. You start wondering, is there anything I can do about this? Because so many of the things you start looking at, it just, the answer is it just gets worse with age. So we started to try to think, is there anything that we can actually do? And I'm in a department of neurobiology. And so we try to think about a lot of mechanisms. And there are things out there that we know in animal models. So people studying mice and rats and, and this kind of thing. There are things that we know in them actually do wonders for these structures in the brain, like the hippocampus, and improve the memory and all this kind of thing. And the question was, could we apply any of what we've learned there actually to us. And the big idea was to use something called environmental enrichment. Basic idea is if you take animals, if you take mice or something like this, and you have them in a typical sort of laboratory environment, which means you've got maybe two, four of them or whatever in a cage. And there you go. That's about it. 
That's not a very rich environment. Now, we may want to call that impoverished instead of normal, but the enriched one then, it's a bigger cage. They have places to explore in here, maybe a running wheel, toys, all sorts of things. I mean, if you've been to a zoo in the last 15, 20 years, you've also seen, again, they give the animals all sorts of things, and they call this enrichment. And it does all sorts of great things. You can see behaviorally, they do a number of things better. You give them things like memory tests, they do better. You look inside the brain, and you see inside the hippocampus itself, there are increased numbers of new neurons born into this one portion of the hippocampus, one of the only two spots that it happens in the adult, in any case, called neurogenesis. You see these things like brain-derived neurotrophic factor that does wonders for all the neurons around, increased levels of that. You have a lot of things like this that go on, and again, they do better. So we see this time and time and time again. Does that apply to us? So could we do an environmental enrichment in us? And if so, how could we actually do that? And that's then where this research on using games really came in. So before you go too deep into that, one of the things Dr. Trin has talked about before is finding memory loss, cognitive decline early. Yeah. Get to it early. And I asked the hard question in a couple of these sessions, so what? So my brain's deteriorating. That's scary. I'm glad you told me, but there's nothing I can do to stop this, right. I've been told. And that's the idea that maybe there's something we can do. Now, whether it's going to stop it, whether it's going to slow it, whether it's going to cover it up for a little bit. At the end of the day, if you're doing better, you're doing better. And we've now been able to see in five published studies that we can actually make your memory better. Wow. wow. Now, I think we chatted a little bit about the hippocampus, Craig which is a part of the brain that helps with storing memory, memory storage. And it is one of the parts of the brain where we see a shrinkage of in patients with Alzheimer's. Yep. Do you know if playing games affect the hippocampus in any way? Has that been looked at yet? So what we know now is that playing games will affect the kind of the memory that is really sensitive to functioning of the hippocampus. And it doesn't affect kinds of memory that aren't tied to the hippocampus. We still don't have the kind of the smoking gun to be able to point at and be able to say that, yeah, we can really see the change using MRI imaging or something like that inside there. I have a little bit of data that points in that direction, but it's been one of these things. I want to have a more solid story before I go and actually put some of that stuff out. There's some tantalizing data on it. But really, at the end of the day, it comes down to we know that we can make memory that requires the hippocampus better. That's the thing that changes. So in some ways, we have an indirect way of being able to say, yeah, the hippocampus is working better. Mm. And what uh, does that mean in terms of results? Does my memory improve? Does my dementia diminish? What? Yeah, what so the quick view as to what the hippocampus does in your day-to-day -day life, if, if you even think about what is memory, what do you think memory is? I forgot. No, that's the obvious joke. <laughs> <laughs> Set you up there. Right. right. But, you know, we think about when people use the term memory, they try to think about things like, yeah, can I remember what I did yesterday? Can I remember the name of somebody that I met before and this kind of thing? And so you're really trying to call back some event mm. episode. We call it episodic memory. And that's the kind of thing that the hippocampus is really involved in. So your ability to actually remember day-to-day -day events, facts and events, episodes in your life. There are a lot of other kinds of memory. So things like how to ride a bicycle, how to talk, how to walk, any of these things. You weren't born knowing how to do them. You had to actually learn them. So it really is memory. But if you put that aside for the moment here, that kind of thing that people think about as memory, that is what the hippocampus is doing. It holds on to stuff. And it tries to hang on to it so that if you keep using it in life, it gets incorporated sort of elsewhere in a permanent kind of way, but it'll hold on to it for hours, days, weeks, months, even years as your brain sort of really figures out, is this something that needs to be held on to permanently? And talk about the difference. I just want to get this kind of explanation out on the table here because I don't really understand the difference between short-term memory and long-term memory. I mean, I guess yeah. I do. Short-term memory is something I did this morning and then I forget about it tomorrow but my brain held on to it, importantly, for some period of time. What's the difference between the two, and when do you move from short-term yeah. to long-term? Yeah, so, okay, this is a really, really common question, and I'm kind of laughing over here because it's even one that 
researchers, depending upon the kind of research you do, you have wildly different definitions for this. So in sort of general lay use of the term, yeah, then you're talking about things like minutes, hours, maybe a day or whatever they sort of call short term. And then longer term, you're talking about things like in that weeks, months, years. Now, researchers who work on humans, short-term memory is on the order of several seconds, maybe 30 seconds or whatever, and you're actively thinking about it, and long-term is anything after that. So you can have long-term memory involved in inside of 30 seconds. But if you're talking about researchers who work in animal models, actually short-term memory is then on the order of minutes, and long-term is anything the problem is that there are really dozens of different mechanisms going on here, and we're trying to stick a simple label of short versus long, and it really doesn't actually apply. Hey, the only reason I bring this up, and Dr. Trin can talk about this, I'll shut up for a second, is I've seen in my own life, when my mother developed dementia, she could remember things from years ago, but she yeah. couldn't remember what mm-hmm. happened five minutes ago. Exactly. And so that kind of thing... That is the hippocampus. Because to remember five minutes ago, you have to have had your hippocampus hold on to this information, quickly adjust some strengths and everything inside of it to be able to hang on to that. And in dementia, hippocampus and its adjacent structures are ground zero. They get taken out. And so therefore, the problem is your mother isn't actually getting that information ever really into and stored in our hippocampus. I've worked with a number of amnesic patients. So if you've seen the movie, there was a movie, Memento, great demonstration of it. But also, Dory in Finding Nemo is a really good amnesic patient. She can't remember what happened. If she gets distracted, she'll Mm -hmm. forget. So these amnesic patients could be telling you a story, and the end of the story would remind them of the beginning of the story, and they could even just loop and tell it again. And you see that sometimes in dementia and everything as well. And it's that kind of thing. And so anything that's in that sort of couple of minutes kind of time frame, you're not actively thinking about it. Your hippocampus is involved until some good amount of time, months, years often is actually gone by. And it's really in the rest of your other spots in the brain. Interesting. So if your hippocampus is not functioning well, that short-term memory doesn't solidify. Exactly. Yeah, to or long-term memory. Or it sounds like or gets stored somewhere else. How and where do you store memories? So the easy answer is that memory is stored in the strengths of the connections between neurons. So your brain has somewhere between 10 and 100 billion neurons, and they all make connections to a bunch of other neurons, maybe on average about 1,000, but huge range on that. And memory is stored as the strengths of the connections between them in a massive, massive, massive neural network here. And so when something new happens, you're tweaking the connections. And this tweaking is going on all the time. The hippocampus is involved in one kind of memory, but also really throughout the brain, this kind of tweaking is going on. As as you're listening to my voice in the auditory cortex here of your brain, it's slightly tweaking to be able to hear me a little bit better. If you've ever encountered somebody with an accent, initially you're like, yeah, this is kind of tough to understand and that kind of thing. But sometimes after even 5, 10, 15 minutes, okay, you've gotten better at it. You've picked up on a bunch here. Well, this is a lot that's going on in terms of tweaking actually the low-level processing. I see yeah, that with my uh, grand- experiences change the way you see and hear the world literally. I see that with my two-year-old grandson who isn't really talking yet. First, it's unintelligible, and then the more time I spend with him, I can sort of pick up what he's saying. I can start to understand what he's saying. Would you say that each memory would be like a specific pattern of connections? My memory of dinner last night is this pattern of connections over here with these set of brain cells, and my memory of breakfast this morning could be this pattern over here with these specific connections of these brain cells. And here's one of the really neat things. You're absolutely right that it's these pattern of connections. And in a lot of the brain, they try to have that pattern so that similar events are using similar, are using overlapping neurons and connections. And so this leads to some really cool things that you can have a new experience and still be able to to deal with it, or I can give you something that's not a word, T-E-L-F. 
Try to pronounce that. T E L F. Telf? Yeah. Everybody's going to come up with something like Telf. All right. You've never had this before, but your brain can generalize and take things that it knows. And you weren't saying like, well, wait a minute, I've seen a T before, and a T makes a T sound, and then here with us, it makes it. You can just go and read that. All right. So a lot of the brain works on this kind of thing. Similar stuff has similar representations, mm-hmm. so you can generalize. It's great. The hippocampus does the exact opposite. What it does is it says, okay, we're going to take these similar things, and we're going to make sure that they are represented as differently as possible. We call this pattern separation. And it does this specifically so that you can learn things quickly. Because Mm -hmm. if you try to have something that is new, but if I told you right now, I'm sorry, that's not actually not pronounced TELF. It's Mm -hmm. pronounced luxury yacht. Sorry to call back to an ancient Monty Python sketch for any of the uh, (laughs) listeners out there. (laughs) If I tell you something like this, it's very, very different. It seems kind of wrong, but you say, okay, no, fine. That's pronounced luxury yacht. All right. You have to overcome all of that stuff that normally would have told you, no, no, it's pronounced TELF. And you want to get it so learning that it means luxury yacht or it's pronounced luxury yacht doesn't overwrite a whole bunch of other things. So if I give you D-L-F, you can say DELF again still and not have to say that, I don't know, maybe that's canoe or something stupid like that because he's kind of weird. So on this kind of thing, the hippocampus intentionally goes and makes things represented in very, very different ways. So then when it goes and quickly changes the strengths of the connection between a bunch of neurons, it's not overwriting a whole bunch of stuff that it already knows. So let me see if I understand this correctly. Let me see if I'm hearing you correctly. You're not just trying to put it into some pattern that's already been in my head Mm -hmm. here. You're saying that the brain doesn't have like a computer, a hard drive, a separate space where it just stores stuff. Because that was my impression always. And therefore, if you get your head banged or you have a head injury, Just like if I dropped my computer, that hard Mm -hmm. drive crashes, and that's where I've lost the data. You're saying the data resides in the connections and not in some central storage unit. And in fact, you have multiple memory systems that are really designed and tuned for different jobs. You have one memory system or mechanism that lets you hold on. Somebody gives you a phone number and you need to repeat it to yourself as you're trying to actively hold on to it, this immediate kind of memory. You got one of those. You also have this thing that's out of that permanent store of facts and events. Yeah, but you also have this hippocampus that's kind of shortish midterm store of facts and events. You have systems that are getting it so you remember how to ride a bike, and they all operate by different rules and different kinds of properties. But you know what? Your computer does that too. Because not only do you have your hard drive, or hopefully by now an SSD or something like yeah. that, but you got your RAM. Okay, and so that's a much faster sort of thing. But you also, and if you turn it off, it goes away. In some ways, that's kind of like a hippocampus here. But you also have inside your main CPU there, there are these caches that are really, really fast and that kind of deal. But a really small kind of setup that's a lot like this immediate and working memory. And then, right, so we have a lot of different memory systems. It's not just one thing. And that's the why you can have something like someone with dementia mm-hmm. who can still remember old stuff, can't remember what happened a day ago, but can remember old stuff, but also you can actually teach them new skills, teach them how to swing a golf club or something like that. They may never not remember that you've been trying to teach them that for the last year, but they can actually still be learning these things at a normal rate. So I'll give you another interesting example that you can dissect here. So prior to my mother developing Parkinson's and developing dementia, she was one of the only people I've ever heard of struck by lightning and lived. Mm -hmm. And her brain and her personality was immediately and forever changed by that experience. And nobody could ever really explain how or why, except that her brain had been hit with this high voltage energy and somehow Mm -hmm. had scrambled something in her mind. Yeah, and exactly what that does, well, it's kind of a tough thing for us to study. You know, you don't get people to sign up for those experiments too often. Oh, they Um, said everybody dies when they get hit by lightning, so she was one of the few to live, yeah. Exactly, and also it's like where were was she actually struck? And maybe if she was struck directly in the head, that would be different than if somebody were hit in the arm or something like this, and so... She was actually holding a phone in an ungrounded building. Wow. Hit the building, came through the phone... And she had the phone and literally knocked her across the room. She was with some other people, and they thought somebody had been shot or something. It sounded like that kind of gun gun going off. And the phone was melted. 
and wow. uh, she lived. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I remember as a kid, those things like, oh, it's a thunderstorm. Don't be on the phone. Yeah. And that's why. That's exactly what happened. All right. Huh. So one of the things they taught her to do in, she went to all sorts of, this is back in Michigan, the University of Michigan. And this is back in the 80s or something, the best minds that my dad could find. One of the things they had her do was what they called multimodality learning. If she wanted to learn something, she had to say it. She mm -hmm. had to read it. She had to read it first and then say it out loud. And the more ways she could do it, if she could read it and then speak it immediately and then do something else with it, the more things she used to get this into her brain, the more likely it would stick. Was she making multiple pathways? Is that what you're doing when you do Yeah, that? and that, that helps in a bunch of ways. And for any listeners out there, you don't have to be struck by lightning for this to be an appropriate <laughs> right. kind of deal. This is great for all of us. And at the beginning of a lot of my courses, I say, okay, here's how you can ace this course. And I list out a number of techniques for making your memory more effective. And this is a classic kind of thing. So you're doing a number of things when you do this. One, you are giving a, sometimes we call it a deeper level of processing. It's not just the sort of surface, what does the word sound like or something like that? It's what does it mean and how is it related to this and this and this and this and this and this. So you're activating a much richer representation of all of this kind of thing. So you're storing a lot more information. Mm. You have all of these associations and connections. And one of the huge problems in memory, sometimes you get things in, but it's the problem of finding it and getting it out. Mm -hmm. We've all had that feeling. In fact, the scientific term for this is the tip of the tongue phenomenon. And seriously, in papers, it's called TOT, tip of the tongue. <laughs> okay. But I know who sung this, who the heck was it, and, and, and Susie and the Banshees. There you go. Finally came in. Again, dating myself here. Wow. Yeah, um, really but are. the thing then with this memory retrieval is memory retrieval is usually, or if not always, driven by giving yourself a little bit piece of it and then seeing can you sort of fill in the rest given this can i fill in the rest can i complete the rest of the information the more little bits that you had there the more sort of roots you actually have into the memory and so if you have thought about what it sounds like what it means etc cetera, etc cetera, you have all of these different sort of aspects to let you get into part of that or as you're fishing around in your memory maybe another little piece comes back you get to reprobe your memory with now that in addition to what you started with and we get that. So it's a deeper level of encoding with the richer processing. You're associating it to things that you already know. That's another great way to have it. You're probably thinking about it longer. So that's repetition and this kind of, all of these things make your memory better. And so it's a great technique for anybody trying to learn anything. That's great. Tell us about your research that was published last year. I saw something about Minecraft and uh, yeah. of that sort and different games. So this all started a number of years ago with that idea of environmental enrichment and how can we use this, you know, as I say, we know that if you have animals and lead this sort of more enriched lives, their memories are better. And how could we port that to people? So we've done one paper on this. I'd had a postdoc, Dane Clemenson, in the lab at the time, and he had this idea that we could actually use off-the-shelf commercial video games as a way to give people enriching experiences. And it's all fine and good if you could do something like, you know, my idea was let's have people doing a semester abroad or maybe let's go and like send 20 people off to Paris or something like that and have a great enriching experience and I volunteer to be the chaperone or something. <laughs> That's all fine and good, but we would want to have more effective, cost-effective ways of doing something like this. And so the idea was, look, gaming companies spend millions and millions and millions of dollars with really bright people and phenomenal game designers and graphic designers engineering these really, really rich, complex experiences. So could that serve like environmental enrichment and give, take that rich experience, feeding the hippocampus all sorts of stuff to learn and do? So if that really is a parallel, we should be able to have our memory outside of the game actually be better. So our first experiments on this, which came out in 2015, first looking at things like college students who game versus don't, and gamers actually have better hippocampal-based memory than ones who don't. The kind of game matters. So we did one even at a competitive tournament, League of Legends versus Super Smash Brothers. League of Legends has strategy. You have to remember the whole thing, where all the resources are, where everybody is, et cetera, et cetera. And Super Smash is a fighting game. The level of performance that these esports athletes have is absolutely incredible trying to be frame perfect across a whole bunch of inputs and a frame is a 60th of a second they're nailing this absolutely perfectly but 
it's not actually helping their memory. And then finally, we'd done a thing where we took non-gamers and we said, okay, look, we're going to have them play a half hour a day for two weeks. And we're going to then see, depending upon what we're doing here, either doing nothing or having a simple game like Angry Birds or a game that actually puts you into a bit of a 3D world and gives you a little bit of exploration and stuff to, you know, do and that kind of thing. We did Super Mario 3D World. We found that actually, if you look before and after, if you're playing something like Angry Birds, it has absolutely no effect. But if you play something like Super Mario 3D World, it actually improves your memory. Wow. So the one then that just came out, that was our fifth in a whole series of these. And then that was trying to say, answer some of the questions like, can we extend this outside of college undergraduates? So that one was done in middle-aged adults. We've also done older adults. Mm -hmm. We've done Super Mario 3D World. We've used Minecraft as a way to actually control the experience and Mm -hmm. see how much of it is learning how to build things inside Minecraft versus the exploration versus, so can we control the world to let us understand what's really driving this effect? And we have even taken it outside of games and done a real-world version of it as well. So I got two questions that come to my mind. One is, is it the richness of the environment or the repetition of doing something? Because I was taught to memorize something, you have to repeat it over and over and over again, like the multiplication table that you endlessly drill these kids on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, look, we've known forever that repetitive practice makes perfect. Yeah, but that's not what we're trying to have you do do here. Yes, if you want to get better and better and better at running that level in Super Mario or something like this, yeah, you're going to have to repeat that over and over again. And so what you're doing there is you're getting better at doing that task. All that repetition stuff holds true. None of that's changed. But that's not what we're really doing here. And that in many ways is the key difference between this research and classic brain training games. Classic Mm. brain training games say things like, hey, your memory's not so great, so I'm going to give you this memory task. Here's a thing that appears here and over here and over here. You have to tell me if it's the same one that happened three trials ago or something like this. Or they do that classic, the game of memory. You have a lot of cards turned over, and you have to turn over this one, try to find where the match was. And so we're just training up your memory and making your memory better. It turns out the problem with all of those is that when you test for other kinds of memory outside of that, you change anything, usually you see that there's no effect. They don't transfer. You get better and better and better at that one game, but you're not transferring. Here, it gets that first idea of yours, the richness of the experience, because it's saying, no, 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 no. We're not trying to make you better at running levels in this game. What we're trying to do is feed your brain new stuff. A famous scientist in our field, Richard Morris, said that what the hippocampus does is the automatic encoding of attended experience. So we're giving you a lot of experiences, and the hippocampus just doing what it's always trying to do and stick it in. And we're giving you different experiences with a lot of cool information and rich information in it. So, for example, in one of the Minecraft ones, we had a blank world, a box with sort of infinite supplies, And we could say, go build whatever you feel like. Maybe start with a house. Turns out, didn't really do anything for folks. All right. But if we then said, instead, blank world, here's a box, try building this thing here. All right, we can even give you some instructions to do it. And then after you've done that, here's a tougher one. Try doing this. How about this? How about this? How about this? And each time, it's pushing you to do more and more complex stuff. Oh, now it actually improves your memory. And the memory mm-hmm. test is totally outside of, of Minecraft or Super Mario or anything. It has nothing to do with plumbers or anything like this or really blocky looking humans and everything. It's completely outside of that. Your memory gets better. But likewise, if we just said, hey, here's a normal Minecraft world, go explore and try to get back to your starting point at the end of each day. Mm-hmm. Just go explore. Explore the world. I don't, don't have to do anything. I don't care. But automatically, you are going and your hippocampus is storing this information away. And why does complexity improve the process or richness? More inputs, more data, more tasks. More stuff. I mean, look, we've all been in a car going somewhere new. And first off, there's this neat phenomenon that going there always seems to take longer than coming back because (laughs) things are no longer new. Going there, everything is new and you're attending to all of this. And so you're sticking all this new stuff in and coming back, it's like, yeah, yeah, there's that gas station again, there's that Dunkin' Donuts, whatever. But also, if you happen to go by there later, I find that sometimes I'm going along and I'm like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. 
I'm here now? I sort of got into an area by a really different sort of route, and then I finally realized, oh my gosh, this is how these things really connect on the map? Wow. All right. But in that kind of thing here, it's not like I was going along in the car in each one of these times saying, I must store this away. This is a study thing that I will be tested on this later. No, my brain was just sticking this stuff away. And I didn't necessarily remember that there was a Chevron and a Dunkin' Donuts there. Mm -hmm. But later on, when I'm in that same spot, oh, wait a minute, I've been here before. This is, oh, this all hooks up and there we go. So your brain is doing this automatically. And the more stuff you're giving it, the more it is actually trying to store away. Do you have any conscious control over the storage of this information? Meaning I've been on a trip and I say to my daughter, my family, remember this moment. I physically say to them, don't forget this. This is really cool. This is really important. Can I prioritize and tell my brain, hey, I don't care what you're doing, but remember this one. Um. (laughs) Um, (laughs) No. Okay, so here's what it comes down to. So the answer, of course, like most scientists, is yes and no. But here's what it comes down to. If you give people, say, a list of words, and you tell them, I'm going to test you on these words later, and so you need to study these, and et cetera, et cetera, versus you don't tell them that, and you just give them a list of words. Typically, performance is exactly the same. Now, sometimes it's a little bit better if you tell them to study it, but what you find out quickly is that people then who are told they should try to remember this start doing some things. They repeat it or something like this, or they try to come up with an association with it or something like that. Right. So if you, though, control what people are doing, so if we give you a list of words and I say, in each one of these letters, count the number of T junctions or the number of vowels or something like this, something really low level that doesn't really matter or whatever, and I tell you, hey, I'm going to test you on these versus I don't tell you that performance is the same. If I do this same kind of thing, but instead I say, hey, look, what I want you to do is I'm going to give you this list of words and I want you to use each one in a sentence. By the way, I'm going to test your memory on these or I don't tell you I'm going to test your memory. Performance is the same across those two things. The intent to know it doesn't matter. It's what you do with the information right then. So if your kids say, oh, wow, Dad really thinks that this is important, so I'm going to attend to it some more. I'm going to think about other times Dad has said things are important and reflect on what a great daddy is and all that kind of thing. Yeah, they're going to remember it better. If they're like, yeah, whatever. The notion then that you can sort of make yourself remember it just by saying that doesn't happen. You have to do something with it to Mm. get it to stick better. So give us some tips, memory tricks. How do I improve? Are there tangible things I can do? Not just go to a rich environment and use my brain more often. Yeah, that rich experience, that environmental enrichment thing, just flat out will actually make your hippocampus work better is the idea. And we've got some pretty good data now to back that up. But no matter what, you can also, when some information comes in, take something like learning someone's name. Mm. At a party, hi, my name's Bob. If you don't do anything with it right then and there, odds are in 30 seconds you're saying to yourself, what the heck was this guy's name? Yeah. And then you're sitting there for like the next hour or whatever, and a guy's still there, and you're like, wow, I have no, I sure hope he introduces himself to somebody else because I have no idea who this is. The problem there is Bob had been in this immediate, or sure, let's call it immediate kind of memory, which has a really, really limited capacity, gets overridden all the time, and if you didn't do anything to try to get us, your hippocampus would hold on to it, your host. But we've already hit a number of these things. First off, repetition. Bob, 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 Bob. His name is Bob. His name is Bob. His name is Bob. Okay. Now then, let me just try actually using it myself here. Different sort of modality and all that kind of thing, generating it. And so, hey, so Bob, what kind of line of work are you in? Or something like that, Bob. Is it a really good line of work, Bob? And okay. So now then, not only are we repeating it, we are spacing it out. And you can also then do some things like we've talked about coming up with associations. The whole thing like come up with a mental image. I can imagine him sitting on a surfboard, bobbing up and down in the waves, I don't know, singing ba 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 baran or something like that. All right, so now I have all of this kind of richness tied to it. I have repeated it multiple times. I've spaced it out. I've tied it with other things I know and all of that. Now then I can go and at the end here, hey, great to see you, Bob. All right, again, I've had another one of those repetitions and spaced out. Right. We know this spacing has a huge effect in this kind of thing, so it works. I mean, you find people who are good with names, They'll tell you, well, of course I do something like that. So, Craig, I had a few meetings this past week with administrators of skilled nursing homes, assisted livings, and retirement centers. With your research at UCI on gaming and showing that it improves memory, what are your thoughts about gaming rooms? 
yeah. in these locations where seniors are retired and there's nothing to do all day. Yeah. What if we put a few arcade games in there? <laughs> so that, I think, no, I think that's actually, if done properly and really thinking about the target audience there in terms of picking out the games, I think that's a phenomenal idea. Because yeah. when we think about this, look, as people are getting older and certainly as they're getting into early stages of dementia, perhaps, and memory loss and this kind of thing, very often their world shrinks. They don't see their friends as much. And we know that social aspect has a huge protective factor, and that's a lot of rich experience stuff. And they're not seeking out new things. They're not traveling anymore. They're not, they're not, they're not. And so they're not only is their system getting worse, but now by not feeding themselves new information all of the time, it's a double whammy and sort of then leads to a positive feedback loop. So if we could have something, now again, it would have to be the right kinds of games. You can't right. just go and say, hey, grandma, here's a keyboard and mouse and here's Duke Nukem even or something like that. So yeah, it won't be Call of Duty. It won't be Call of Duty. It, it won't be that. No. Yeah. No. But there are a lot of games that are much more just free, open exploration, very simple kind of controls. There's a reason why we picked Super Mario 3D World, because if you think about it, for one, you don't have the sort of violent aspect that a lot of people get worried about, and that's a whole other set of conversations. But a second aspect is, this is a game that's designed for little kids to be able to play, really, really young kids to be able to play, all the way up through teenagers and adults. We'll still find value and fun and everything in it. And some of them will also have things like, oh, okay, you seem to be stuck. Here's the path, and it'll highlight and this kind of thing, and some of the more right. updated ones and everything on it. I just played the game Stray. The controls are very simple. You're a cat, and you're exploring a world. But it's giving this rich kind of experience in everything here. And so things like this actually could be done, could be mapped fairly easily. So if you think about the game, what it requires, it can't need very right. rapid, precise timing and all of this kind of thing. All right. I think it'd be great. And it's a great thing to try. Here's a question somebody just asked on Twitter here through our feed here. Is there a difference between pleasure and pain? Do you remember more one more than the other? Some people saying, if you make it pleasurable, you'll never forget it. And there's some people, the great Buddha, I think, was quoted as saying, you remember one bad thing more than you will 10 good things. Is right. that true? So we have a structure right next to the hippocampus called the amygdala. And the amygdala, you can characterize it as involved in the Fs, fear, fight, fight or flight. Um, procreation. <laughs> yes. That's the F that goes with that one. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Um, and so each of these things, the point of it in many ways is to be able to highlight a memory and be able to say that right there, remember that. Yeah, right. Exactly. And so it gets it so that the hippocampus and other structures actually then store the information better. So obviously a fearful kind of thing or a pain sort of thing. If you do something and it, it hurts you badly, remember, yeah, don't do that again. Don't touch that stove. And that's a very, very powerful kind of thing. The pleasure ones, however, if you are hungry and you find food, if you are thirsty and you find water, those things also get it. Look, they give the little dopamine hit and this kind of deal. Drugs of abuse, take that pleasure angle and the dopamine hit from it and get it so that those memories are insanely well laid down and incredibly difficult to actually go and overcome. And this is one of the real mechanisms of drug abuse is that it, it's leading to these incredibly well burned in habits, even in just sometimes a very few number of episodes. So both of them do work. It is often easier to have that pain one go and trigger that sort of response in particular in our lives right now, most of us don't have to deal then with the, I can't get food. There certainly are some. And then when you find someone that got you food, yeah, okay, how did I do that? That worked. So pleasure pain will amplify an experience through the amygdala and yep. make it prioritized. Exactly. Amygdala, isn't the amygdala kind of like the security guard, like your security guard to protect your mind and your body against potential harmful experiences. It's kind of like the fight or flight. It's got that fight and flight, but it also has got that procreation. If you stick somebody inside of a MRI scanner and you show happy faces and angry faces and this kind of thing, you can get the amygdala to line up. You have a pain response or whatever kind of thing or in sorrow. You show people like sad movies. You show people pornography. The amygdala lights up like crazy. 
not yeah. my studies, but uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now I know where you're getting all the money. Who, who was doing this research or whatever, sort of on the, the spot next door, and it's like, you sure you don't work here, Paul? Because <laughs> yes. you know, they're my experiments. Looking at porn all day long. No, 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 um, this is for a good cause. Yeah, right. Exactly. So, all right, that's interesting. So could you, through gamification, amplify the pleasure or pain aspect? Could it be frightening? Yeah, you can, could you it can be give, the, right, in these games, yeah, they are getting your emotions going. And so that's certainly then leading to remembering those portions and everything better. The founder of my department, one of the first faculty at UCI at its, at its opening kind of thing, Jim McGaw, this is exactly what he studied for, uh, for many, many decades. All right, next question that goes with that. Explain to me the connection between senses and memory, because I'm told often, Dr. Trins talked about it, a patient that has lost Alzheimer's. Has mm -hmm. lost Vision. It's that lack of stimulation, right, or lack of that connection when you lose a sensory pathway like hearing. Does that uh, impact if I go deaf? Does that make my memory go down if I'm blind does that make it harder for me to remember things not necessarily no because you can be sort of attending then to those domains that you actually do have and so then being there's some of the classic stuff and it's debated a little bit in terms of exactly how much this is true in terms of does a blind person have better hearing right and this kind of thing at the very least they're certainly attending to information coming in from those domains that they still do have a lot more. And so very often making sort of distinctions and, and having more rich information that's getting encoded and everything from that. So no, it's not I mean certainly your ability to remember shades of blue. If you have been blind from birth, that's a pretty obvious one that that's going to be a little bit of a challenge for you. But in and of itself, just sort of losing a domain won't necessarily make your raw memory and everything any worse but it would seem if you are it, having a progressive disease that's yeah. going on here and that's then what's leading to these if you're having strokes if you're having a number of things that are leading to all sorts of damage throughout the brain well yeah you've got damage that's going on throughout the brain and that's going to be having a lot of effects because dr trin talked about it in an early episode and i thought this had some anecdotally in my life as my father lost his hearing he talked less he listened mm -hmm. less, and he seemed right. to shut down more. Mm -hmm. And I can't prove that that was tied to his cognitive decline, but it certainly went hand in hand with it. It absolutely, I mean, but yes. a lot of the things we need to pick apart here as researchers is, was it the hearing that was leading to that? Well, certainly talking less and engaging less right. with other people, yeah, it absolutely could be. Because if he can't partake in the conversation, then he's not and, 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 and all right. of those things. Absolutely, that's a real thing. At the same time, it could also be that, well, as we're aging, our hearing gets worse and all of these other things happen as a function of the aging. So we always try to see how much of is one and how much is the other. I mean, look, your hair gets whiter. Do we think it's the white hair that makes it so that your memory is worse? Well, probably not. But as the hearing is leading to less engagement in conversations, less engagement with people, and all of that, then that obviously is then factoring into this that way quite clearly. Yep. So what uh, about the other connection that I think is strange between a memory and a sense trigger? Something I had forgotten. I smell something that I hadn't mm -hmm. smelled in 20 years, and all of a sudden I get this overwhelming memory that comes back when I first smell that. I'll give you a classic example of weird one. After my father died, he used to take me to the mall game in Detroit, and they have these real strong-smelling hot dogs in Detroit, Coney dogs. Mm -hmm. And I went to a restaurant out in the desert where he lived that specialized in Detroit food. I don't know. I can't be two of those in California. And he brought me this. I said, well, i got to have one of those old Coney dogs, and they fly him in from Detroit and everything. The minute I smelled it, I started crying. And yeah. I was overwhelmed by this. And now I'd lost my father, so maybe that invoked that. Mm -hmm. But this feeling of, oh, my God, just smelling that thing brought back memories that I had forgotten about. Yeah, exactly. So what you're doing is you're giving a cue, a part of the memory there, and it's going giving that retrieval. And one of the cool things is people use smell here as the standard for all of this, in part because in our day-to-day -day world, we don't 
really experience it a lot with smells. A number of animals do. Mm -hmm. We don't. And so that kind of, so visually, like, look, we've seen tons and tons and tons of faces every day. And so there isn't that really unique standout kind of thing. If you only ever saw one face a day or one face every couple of weeks or something like this, and all of a sudden, maybe that actually would be such a powerful kind of cue. But with smells, they're the day-to-day kinds of things, and there really isn't very much. It's, we're not so driven by it, but there are certainly very distinct, unique kinds of things. And for you here, that smell is tied to a particular place and time. Go into the ballpark there, and that's what it's tied to, period. You haven't had those hot dogs come up all throughout the rest of your life. Because, if, for example, if you did, if basically it smelled the same as, like, any cookout hot dog or whatever kind of thing, and you'd been it wouldn't have had then that same kind of trigger because that smell is now tagged to thousands of different kinds of memories or whatever. Right. But right now, that smell tied to the one thing, and that's it. And the same thing so, with music. Dr. Trinch talked about talking about yeah. where the people are music therapists where they get people who can't communicate, have lost all memory, and yet they can sing a song suddenly that yeah. they sang as a child. Yeah, so, I mean, I just got back into listening to a group that I listened to a bunch in high school. And when I would first start putting it on, I went straight back and I remembered the guy. It wasn't even, a, it was just sort of like acquaintance, a classmate kind of thing, but he was massively into this band. The band is Yes. And oh, yeah. he would go and he's, and he's like, Christopher Squire, and he'd like air guitar and all this kind of thing. And then I went straight back to that, just listening to it. because And again, I hadn't heard the music and everything in a good long time. I'm certainly a little bit since then, but it was so tied to that moment in place. But there is another aspect in all of this that we have to not lose sight of. If you notice, each one of these things is bringing back a childhood kind of memory. Yeah. Yep. It's not an infantile childhood sort of memory. You know, that stuff really is lost. But it's really often in a formative year kind of thing. Call it 8 to 18 or somewhere in here. A lot of this stuff is. You're learning so much new about the world and who you are. Your brain is finally going through like the whole maturation, really settling down into the brain that you're going to have largely as an adult and everything here. And there's so much of defining who you are at that time. Your parents, things you're doing, your friends, things you're doing, all that kind of thing. And so, yeah, so many of the things, our mannerisms, our slang, our musical taste, all sorts of things really get laid down a lot then. And it's really rare that you'll have somebody end up being, it's like, oh, wait a minute, no, 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 this was then bringing back something from when I was 40. There are some things like this, like, oh, that was my wife's perfume or something like this. And, you know, she died years ago. There certainly are some on that, but a lot of them are also tied to a time and place in which you are really defining a lot and everything of who you are. And that's when our personalities are being developed, our fears, our pleasure experiences, And who we are as an adult is typically the consequences of childhood experiences. Exactly. Which is why it's so hard in therapy to go expunge these, to learn that that's the way something happened to me and forever I'm scarred by that experience. I think that's going to happen over and over again. Just could happen when I was eight. My father left me at the store and now I'm forever fearing of being lost or something here. Yeah, but that's the whole basis of it. But the whole point in therapy there is to bring those back up and now learn a new association with them. So all of cognitive behavioral therapy, talk therapy, uh, meditation from the Buddha. I read this great book a number of years ago by this guy, Mingur Yangi Rinpoche. It's called Like the Joy of Living. And he was making this line saying that you take a lot of behavioral therapy kinds of things, and what their whole deal is, is think about this, now here's another association with it back and forth and back and forth to try to have that. You look inside the brain, this thing, long-term potentiation, which is the thing that changes the strengths of the synapses between these neurons and leads to memory. Get them both firing, neurons that fire together, wire together, and then it (laughs) forms that association between them. But meditation, and even what the Buddha was saying with the whole the monkey mind and this kind of thing, is like, look, this whole deal is we need to get it so that you experience this kind of thing, you have it, but now you're learning to sort of let it go have a different sort of reaction and everything. It's conditioning. Wow. It's Pavlov and his dog. All of this is actually wonderfully related. The neurobiology is there. We've known about, I mean, the Buddha nicely sort of articulated a whole bunch of it here. It's used as a cornerstone of so much therapy and everything now. And yeah, because it's true and that's how our brain works. So the takeaway from today's show as we wrap up is 
the neurons that fire together, wire together. That should be on a T-shirt. Fire together and wire together here. If you yep. associate things, and you can create new associations. And, therefore and, and that is really it. Look, learning and memory can get you into a lot of problems. I mentioned drug addiction because, right. hey, look, you sort of highlight with dopamine this, this memory, and it gets you into that problem. Post-traumatic stress disorder is sort of the right. poster child for this. You have some bad event and it's stuck and you keep reliving it. Obsessive compulsive disorder are these habits that are ingrained so hard you can't not do them. Rumination and depression and all of these things, learning and memory has sort of gotten you into these problems. But at the same time, learning and memory can help wire you out of those problems as well. You are never too old. Your brain is changeable, plastic, malleable. You can rewire it at any stage in life. And so these kinds of things are out there and learning and memory is the way to rewire your brain. Fascinating. Thank you so much, guys. I'm hopping off to my 9 a.m. We got to bring you back here. Craig, there's so much more to talk so about. So much more. And, uh, sure then. Appreciate you coming on today. So much more to talk about, guys. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. There you have it. One more reason. You got to tune in each and every time because you can rewire your brain, apparently. Stuff you only hear right home. Talk, health Talks here at OC's UCI's Health Talks with Dr. Trin. Streaming live from our studios here at the University of California Irvine's Beal Applied Innovation Center.